<coughs> well, first of all, thank you for allowing me to be here this morning. It's lovely to join with you. It's always a pleasure to come here to Staplehurst. Uh, you have a lovely fellowship here, and it's a pleasure to, uh, to be of service to you, and I trust today uh, I can be. Most importantly, we come to meet with the Lord. Uh, he is our leader, our great resource, the one that we hope we want to see and to serve this morning. I'm guessing that there are a few here this morning, not all obviously, who can actually remember 1963. Now if you're way too young for that, bear with me, there is a point. Um, 63, well, if like me you were a, a brand new teenager, uh, you may remember the year of the Beatles' very, very first ever hit, Please Please Me. That may ring a bell for one or two. More importantly, and I'm guessing more memorably, you may remember that is the year in which um, President Kennedy was assassinated. And we all know the, the sort of cliché that goes with that, but in my case it is true. I really can remember exactly where I was and what I was doing when I heard the news. And I think a whole generation can Rather like that 9-11 moment when the Twin Towers came down, it just burned itself uh, into your memory. But something else happened in 1963, and it was a very precious and powerful moment. One of my heroes is Martin Luther King, and that was the year when he held his great Washington rally, when a stupendous number of people gathered, to, to speak really for black equality and black rights. Uh, Martin Luther King was a wonderful speaker, a great orator, and, and, and spoke that day perhaps one of the world's greatest speeches ever spoken, I Have a Dream. And I'm sure there are those of us here perhaps who could even quote chunks of what he said that day. And he quoted from an old southern hymn, free at last, free at last, Thank God Almighty, I'm free at last. These chapters in Exodus are all about freedom and what freedom means. Four things I would like us to share this morning from these verses, and they're all about freedom. Freedom brings challenges to face. Freedom brings temptations to avoid. Freedom brings blessings to embrace and it brings a purpose to pursue. Freedom brings challenges to face. I wonder, if you were asked, do you think children are more free or less free than adults? I wonder what you would decide. It's one of those could be either way questions, isn't it? Kind of, you know, it all depends what you mean by sort of answers. Uh, perhaps you, like me, look back with nostalgia to the carefree fun of childhood when it was perfectly okay to play outside for hours and end. Nobody worried, nothing dreadful seemed to happen. But of course the reason we felt free is that the responsibility for being safe didn't rest on us, it rested on our parents. They were looking out for us, keeping us safe, making all the big decisions. They were providing all the things we needed, the food, the clothes, the physical care, Transport. I remember when my own daughter was a teenager, I seemed to become social secretary and chauffeur, basically, uh, answering the phone and driving her to places and then getting up at some unearthly hour to drive her back so she would be safe. Being an adult sometimes is harder. All right, yes, we can make our own decisions. We can make our own choices. We can run our own lives. But is that liberating? Or is it actually a burden? Or perhaps it's both. Maybe that's what it is. Maybe it's both. Before he healed them, Jesus often asked people if they wanted to be healed. Do you remember the question he often asked, what would you like me to do for you? And I can remember as a child thinking, what a stupid question. I mean, the guy can't walk. What would you like me to do? Well, I'd like double glazing, please. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's so painfully obvious, but Jesus asked. Why did he ask? I think Jesus understood something that I came to understand perhaps in my later years, that being set free from a difficult situation also would bring responsibility. These people had not, up until that point, had to accept the full responsibility for their lives. I'm not suggesting disability is great or fun. I don't mean that. That would be ridiculous. 
but they had been fed and clothed and all the decisions had been made and they'd been moved around by other people. If they were healed, they would have to do that for themselves. Are you ready for that? Jesus said. Do you actually want that? Because the two will have to go together. You see, the Israelites had for a very long time been slaves in Egypt. Who wants to be a slave? Nobody wants to be a slave. Slavery is vile. It's an evil thing. We all know that. Life was hard. But if you towed the line, if you behaved yourself, if you did as you was told and fulfilled the quota, the necessities were provided. They got the food, they got the housing, they got what they needed. I know they worked very hard for it. But there were some responsibilities they didn't have to have, and it wasn't all bad. Do you remember later on that lovely moment in the desert when yet again they're having a whinge at Moses? And what they remember is, why can't we go back to Egypt? Because then we had melons and cucumbers and garlic and onions. Well, it wasn't all bad, was it? Not entirely. You see, when Christ sets us free... It's not a magic carpet ride to the promised land with all comforts provided. It's the start of a long, obedient walk. That's what faced these people, a very long, rather disobedient actually, walk to the place that God was taking them. And we do it following Jesus. We're called, if you like, to be adults and accept the responsibilities that go with being an adult and to be responsible for our walk. Responsibility is a challenge. And this journey, as we read in these verses, we find not only is the responsibility going to be a challenge, the journey itself was going to be a challenge. Verse 18, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though that was shorter. Verse 18, God led them by the desert road toward the Red Sea. Whatever in the world was God doing? Why not the short road? Why the desert road? But that's what God chose. See, sometimes God doesn't promise, well, in fact, God never promises to lead us by the road that we expect. Sometimes in life, let's be honest, he takes us by the long road. Have you ever walked the long road? Perhaps some of you have. You know what the long road feels like. And you wish there was a shorter road, but that's not where he's taking you. He's taking you by the long road. And sometimes he takes us by the desert road. Have you ever walked God's desert road? Perhaps you have. Sometimes in life it feels very much like a desert road. There isn't much refreshment. There's not much that's green. There's not much that's nice. But you're walking it with God. I never thought it would be like this, has been said by most Christians actually, sooner or later at some point in their Christian life. Can you imagine Daniel as he's dragged towards the lion's den, quietly thinking inside his head, I never thought it would be like this. Or maybe Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego about to be hurled into the furnace. I never thought it would be like this. <laughs> or perhaps almost comically, though not really, Jonah inside the fish where it says in chapter 2 he prayed, I never thought. It would be like this. Had God abandoned any of these people? No, none of them. Was going to use, God going to use these people? Yes, hugely, for his purpose and for his glory. But they never thought it would be like this. Sometimes the journey is a challenge. We don't have an exemption certificate. Oh, if only we did. Can you remember? Like a kind of COVID passport. A sort of difficulty passport. Right, says God, here's your passport, now you're on my side, there won't be any problems. Oh, wouldn't that be great? But it's not what he's given us. We don't have an exemption certificate from a difficult journey. He wants us instead to travel our journey with him by faith. He says, I'm not going to make it comfortable, but I am going to go with you, as we shall see again in a few minutes' time. He wants us to put our hand in his hand. That's a bit like childhood again, isn't it? our hand in his hand and trust him. I wonder if some of you remember, do you remember the old green youth praise songbook? Now that's, now I'm, I'm back there again, aren't I? But some of you will know the one I mean. Maybe when you were younger you played a few pieces from it. Perhaps you still do. That song that says, I do not know what lies ahead, the way I cannot see, but one stands near who holds my hand and he will walk with me. I know who holds the future, 
and I know he holds my hand. With God, things don't just happen. Everything by him is planned. So, as I face the future, with its problems large and small, and you know the last line, I'll trust the God of miracles. Give to him my all. The journey was a challenge. And then the enemy, of course, was a challenge. Well, it would be, wouldn't it? The Egyptians had just, hadn't just given up and gone away. They were still there, and they were coming after them in hot pursuit. It was the elite, elite cavalry, if you like, the chariots. It was the tank corps of the Egyptian army, the ultimate weapon that Egypt had. This, this was fearsome, terrifying. Chariots against infantry was, was, was a no-brainer, and chariots against unarmed civilians was a massacre. There was no, it was obvious what they were facing at. They hadn't gone away, these Egyptians. But the Israelites, it says in verse 18, went out of Egypt ready for battle. Hmm. And God kind of said with a wry smile, ha ha. Actually, they haven't. And in verse 17, this is what God says about their readiness for battle. God said, if they face the enemy, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. This was no army ready for battle. This was a, a nation in the making, given its freedom and heading towards its promised land. So far, so good. But an army ready for battle, they were not yet. One day they would be, but not yet. It can come as a shock, can't it, to realize that we have an enemy. But the more we stand for Christ, the more the enemy will attack, and he's got chariots too. Mind you, if you know your second book of Kings, you will know that God has fiery chariots. But that's another sermon, another story, and another day. Not now, all right. We're not going sideways onto that one. And that enemy that we have will stop us any way he can, won't he? You know that. He will perhaps demoralize us. You know, it really isn't worth the effort, is it? Do you waste your time doing all this church stuff for? Or he'll confuse us. He'll have us running in a dozen different directions, not knowing which way to go. Or he'll just plain frighten us. That's where the Israelites were. Just panic, fear. Or he'll exhaust us. Just give us so many things to do. We're so burned out, we can't do any of them. He has many tactics, and he attacks us always at our weakest point. For the Israelites, that day, was, it was fear. So how do we as Christians stand strong against the enemy that pursues us? It's very simple. We keep our eyes on Christ. Never mind looking at the enemy. Look at him. We listen to the Spirit's voice, not the enemy's voice. Oh, there's always the enemy whispering in our ear. You're not really going to do that, are you? Really? Honestly. God. You know, we need to open our Bibles, don't we, and read what God says to us. And we stand firm on God's word and not let the enemy make us doubt it. Always his favorite tactic. And so there was a challenge to face. Secondly here, the, fre the freedom road brought temptations to avoid. The big temptation, strangely, and you may think this is kind of a paradox, but it is true. The big temptation was to go back into slavery, into Egypt. And you think, well, <laughs> they've, they've wanted for nearly 400 years to get out. And now that they're out, their first thought is, let's go back. Chapter 14, 11 to 12, they said to Moses, didn't we say to you in Egypt, let, leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than die in the desert. And 14, 17, what God said, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. God knew exactly where their minds were. Slavery, strangely, proved to be a very hard habit to break. Remember, all addictions in our world, addiction is a kind of slavery. You're not free because your body is just addicted to something, demands it, screams for it, it's used to it, feels as if it needs to have it. Addictions are very hard to break, and sometimes the addiction can seem like a safer option. The person who's clamored to give up drink, but there's just that one that lures them back. You know the kind of situation, don't you? And sometimes the familiar can seem better than the unfamiliar. The devil you know, rather than the devil you don't. And Satan, of course, always wants to return us to the slavery of sin doesn't want us getting free in the first place, but if we've got free, he will do everything he can to bring us back. It can seem sometimes 
a safe option. He can make it sound very attractive, can't he? God knew there would be times when his people would long to go back. Why did you bring us out into the wilderness to die? The title you gave me today was Keep the Faith. And that word keep is important. Keeping it means remaining in it. It means being faithful to it. It means not being diverted from it. Moses said it very well in chapter 14, 30, stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you this day. Now here's a big lesson. I don't want to go into lecture mode, forgive me if it sounds like it, but can I say this? Stand firm is always right. Stand still is never right. And we have them both in these verses. Isaiah said in chapter 7, if you do not stand firm in your faith, you will not stand at all. I think there's a very powerful text, actually. Stand firm is how we face the enemy. And ironically, Moses got it exactly right in verse 13 and completely wrong in verse 14. Because he spoiled it when he went on. And he said, you only need to stand still. God never told them to stand still. And you could almost hear the scream from heaven as God shouts in Moses' ear, in, in, a, in an instant, for heaven's sake, Moses, what are you telling them? Don't tell them that. The Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. The way to freedom was not standing still, it was standing firm. And that's a profoundly different thing. If they stood still, they'd never cross the Red Sea, would they? They'd have stayed on the wrong side of it. The promised land was on the other side of it. They had to go forwards. In the old King James Version, it says, speak to the people that they go forwards. I remember one preacher saying with a wry smile in his face, if you've got the desert to the north of you, the desert to the south of you, the Red Sea in front of you and the Egyptian army behind you, which way is forwards? Which is a fair question, isn't it? Speak to the people that they go forwards. Well, the answer to that, of course, is the way forwards is the way God had told them to go. It's always the way to go. If in doubt, go the way that God has told you to go, and God had told them which way to go. They just had a, a Red Sea in the way. That's all. And if that sounds facetious, it's not, is it? That's all. What's the problem with the Red Sea? Said God, I can, I can dry that up. Just hold your stick out. That's all you're going to do. Can you hold a stick out, Moses? Yes, I can do that. Fine, you do that, and I'll do the stuff you can't do. Big lesson there. I mean, again, I mustn't get diverted. We could preach a whole sermon or half a dozen on the crossing of the Red Sea. Fabulous story. I love that bit, and sorry, forgive me, I am getting diverted, aren't I? I can't help it. But it just it's that moment of humour when it says God looked down and he made all the wheels of their chariots come off. Can't you just imagine? He's, got, he's playing with them. He's having wonderful fun. Bing! Oh, there's another one. Bing! Off come the wheels. Bing! There's another chariot gone. Bing! There's another one. God's just... I mean, the, do you remember that verse that says, the Lord shall, shall laugh and have his enemies in derision? Isn't this the perfect moment? Sorry, I've gone all over the place. I'm nowhere near my notes. But you understand what I mean. This is not a problem for God. Just go forwards. And I will deal with the problem, says God. What I want you to do is obey me. Standing still is never the answer. And if you're thinking, yes, but there's that psalm and that lovely worship song that says be still. Yes, be still is about our inner peace and calm. It is about our trust relationship with God. It is about the peace and calm God gives us in our hearts and minds. It is not about our feet. It is about our minds and our hearts. Individuals that stand still stop growing. Remember that verse in Hebrews, go on to maturity. Go on is what God says. And a church, of course, that stands still is actually slowly dying. Big lesson. Churches must never stand still. They can't. The vision is always in front of you. Forwards is never backwards. It is never back to the good old days. It is always onwards. Jesus said, no one who puts a hand to the plough and looks back is fit for service. Thirdly, I must get on, mustn't I? Freedom brings blessings to embrace. If it all sounds like a terrifying prospect with nothing but gloom, it isn't. Freedom is wonderful. We were created for freedom. When God made us, Genesis 1 and 2, he made us free. 
sin was what enslaved us. When Christ came and he died on a cross, it was so that we could be free. It is for freedom, as it was quoted in our prayer before our service this morning, that verse from Galatians 5. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. And he paid a massive price, the greatest price ever paid in history. That's what redemption means. It is our freedom price, our slave price. You redeem a slave. God redeemed us from slavery. It is the greatest price ever paid for our freedom. So it isn't negative. It's a wonderful thing, even though it brings challenges. Freedom has blessings to embrace. And amidst all their chaos and doubt and fear and confusion, God spells out for them their, the blessings that he's going to give them. Now, there are hundreds of blessings. If we had to list all the blessings, we'd be here for months. But there are, there are just a few. I would suggest four in these verses. There is the blessing of guidance. God wasn't sending them to the promised land. He was leading them to the promised land. Yes? Do we understand the difference? A good officer leads his men. He doesn't drive his men. He doesn't send his men. He stands at the front. He goes first and he says, now follow me. That's what Jesus said, isn't it? I go at the front, you follow me. That's leadership. And God is in front of us and he is leading us. First, chapter 13, 21, a pillar of cloud by day went ahead of them. And we have a God who has gone ahead of us on our journey and he leads us forwards. Jesus said, I will be with you to the end of the age. I will never leave you nor forsake you. He is our Emmanuel, isn't he? He is our God who is with us. We don't travel one single step of our journey alone. That's encouraging. God wanted them to know that. Secondly, they have the blessing of light. Chapter 13, 21, a pillar of fire by night. Well, the application's obvious, isn't it? You don't need a preacher to point that one out. Jesus said it. I am the light of the world. God was literally a light in their lives, and he's spiritually the light of our lives too. Your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path, it says in Psalms. Every step we take with Jesus, we take in the light. And a dark world needs the light of Jesus, doesn't it? Isn't that our commission? To share the light. He's given us the light. Our job is to share it. There's the blessing of protection. God stood behind them to protect them from the pursuing Egyptians. That's in 1419 and 1422. God's protecting presence doesn't mean that nothing bad will happen to us, of course, but it does mean that God is with us in everything that does happen. He is working through it for our good. And if that sounds a bit like Romans 8, it's meant to. We know that in all things, God works for good to those who love him. God only ever works for our good. God doesn't work for bad in any of our lives. We wouldn't expect him to. But it can be tough, and it can mean patient obedience. But he is working for our good. He, we, there is the blessing of protection. And of course, there is the obvious blessing of deliverance. The whole book of Exodus is about deliverance. And actually, we could go much bigger than that, couldn't we? The whole book, I mean the book, all 66 books of the book, is about deliverance. It is God's salvation plan from Genesis through to Revelation of how he will rescue and redeem and deliver a sinful and lost and enslaved people. It's a story of dramatic rescue. It's a huge miracle and it's an object lesson to the people that God was with them, this whole Red Sea thing. And if he could do it at the Red Sea, he could do it again and again and again. He could bring water from a rock. He could, do, he could do any of the things they needed. He could bring them quails when they wanted meat and rain manna from heaven to feed them every day. It wasn't a problem for God because the God who delivered them would provide for them. Here is the great message, surely, of Exodus. So we draw towards a close, don't we? Freedom brings challenges to face. It brings temptations to avoid. It brings blessings to embrace. But finally, it brings a purpose to pursue. In these verses, I think God shows his fourfold purpose. Did you notice them? He is delivering. He is creating. He is defeating. And he is affirming 
He's delivering from slavery, as we just said, God's salvation work. Here is the picture of the cross, God's greatest act of deliverance. Redemption means our slavery debt is paid and we are free. That's worth a little hallelujah or praise the Lord, isn't it? I'm sorry, I'm not trying to provoke one, but, you know, we are so terribly English, aren't we? You know, yeah, okay. Delivering and creating. Creation isn't all in Genesis 1 and 2, you know. God is still creating. He's creating a people for himself. He said, I will build a church. God is building. He's building in us. He's building with us. He's building through us. He's building for us. There's another sermon, but again, not for now. All right. But we have a creator God who's still creating. And he's creating there. What is he creating? He's creating actually a covenant people. That's what these slaves are going to be. They're going to be his covenant people. They're going across to the land we will call Israel. They didn't yet, but we do. And there they would be his covenant people. Aren't we also his covenant people? We are people of the new covenant. We've just celebrated it with the bread and the wine, haven't we? This is the blood of my new covenant, which is given for you, Jesus said. We are people of the covenant. The church collectively is God's new people. United not by a covenant of law like they were from Sinai onwards, but a covenant of grace. Which would you rather have? <laughs> Obvious, isn't it? We have a covenant of grace. There's another praise the Lord, I think, probably. And then, of course, defeating, defeating the enemy. The cross, the empty tomb, the defeat of our two greatest enemies. The cross defeated the enemy of sin, the tomb empty defeated the great enemy of death. One day Satan himself, the great enemy, will ultimately and forever be defeated, however much he chases after us. The enemy you see this day, the Egyptians, let's get it right, the Egyptians you see this day, you will see no more. Well, yes, that's worth a hallelujah too. A lot of hallelujahs in this, in this wonderful passage. There is the promise that lies ahead of us. We still have an enemy at the moment. He's still a roaring lion going up and down. But he is a defeated enemy. And one day he will be a disappeared enemy, a dealt with enemy, utterly and eternally. And finally God is affirming that fourth thing he's doing. He's affirming his lordship. And it's here in these verses. I'm not just tagging it on. It's there. The Egyptians, we read, needed to see his lordship. Chapter 14, 18, God says, The Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I gain glory through Pharaoh. There, there's a par paradox, isn't it? Not despite Pharaoh, through Pharaoh. God can use his enemies to gain glory, his chariots and his horsemen. God is never diminished by his enemies. We don't have to fear for God's well-being. Nothing threatens him. And he is with us. And his people, of course, all know, also needed to see that lordship. Chapter 14, 31, the very end of our reading. When the Israelites saw the mighty hand of the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord, and they put their trust in him and in his servant Moses. Well, it would have been nice if it had lasted a little longer. They stumbled a few times, and so do we. So do we. But God is a covenant God, and he would keep his covenant promise to his people even when they sometimes failed him. Freedom is a wonderful thing, isn't it? And it's a costly thing. Christ died to bring us our freedom, and it's not necessarily a comfortable thing. So, what do we do? We embrace its blessings, we accept its responsibilities, we resist its temptations, we work for its purpose to be God's distinctive covenant people and to tell other people the only message that will ever set them free. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for the freedom we have in Christ. We thank you for all its blessings. We pray that you will be with us in all its temptations and challenges. And we pray that we may serve you faithfully for its purpose. In Jesus' name. Amen.